and get started. My name's Thomas First. I'm at Idaho National Lab, and I'm working on, on tritium transport and molten salt reactors. There's sort of two parts of my talk. One will be sort of talking about the tritium transport properties that are observed in the molten salt reactor, as well as an experiment that we're designing at INL to, to evaluate tritium transport in molten salt reactors. So again, tritium is the radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It's a weak beta emitter with a half-life of 12.3 years. It's produced from neutron irradiation of light isotopes and terminary fission. Lithium is the key player here. FLIB is our best molten salt for thermal physical properties and neutronic properties standpoint. However, it does produce tritium. There's sort of two ways to get around this. Well, well one way, one is to enrich in, in lithium-7 to sort of limit that tritium production. Uh, even then, an MSR would be anticipated to produce a significant amount of tritium, uh, nominally on the same order as a, as a heavy water reactor, uh, even when lithium-7 is enriched. Uh, that value is taken from an MSBR a design study from the 70s. Uh, alternatively, on a sort of a better note, you could just leave natural uh, lithium-6, which has an abundance of 7.5%, generate the tritium and sell it as a byproduct uh, for helium-3 or, or fusion plant startup inventories. Uh, on the negative side, tritium is highly mobile. It diffuses throughout the system, particularly hot structural metals, uh, which leads it to an issue for safety and licensing. Just to highlight the migration pathway of tritium, it's produced by actions of neutrons with lithium. Uh, then you have speciation and corrosion, whether it is in the form of tritium fluoride or molecular tritium T2. It'll uptake in the graphite core. It'll evolve through the plenum and the off-gas system. And then again, tritium is unique as it'll diffuse through those hot structural materials. Uh, so it can diffuse through the primary system structural materials, diffuse through the heat exchanger material into the secondary coolant, and then so on into the, the ternary system. Sort of high overview of, of tritium transport in molten salt reactors. Uh, in molten salts, tritium is dissolved as molecules following Henry's law. So its concentration of the salt is dependent on um, pressure and the Henry's law uh, solubility coefficient in metals. Uh, tritium dissolves as atoms. Uh, so it'll be Sievert's law, which is dependent on the square root of pressure and the Sievert's law solubility coefficient. Um, Tritium readily diffuses through the solid structural materials and its steady state is sort of tritium permeation flux is dependent on that external mass transfer from the salt to your wall surface. Uh, then the dissociation on your, on your wall surface, it's uh, interstitial diffusion through your, your metal structure and then recombination on that sort of downstream side and then external mass transfer, whether that is your, your room or, or your secondary or ternary coolant tritium transport properties in, in molten salts. So unfortunately, our experimentally measured solubility of tritium in molten salts spans roughly four orders of magnitude. Uh, the difference there can be attributed a bit to the difficult measurement of that, but also speciation, uh, whether the tritium is T2 or tritium fluoride. Uh, this has been elucidated a bit with some more recent EFT studies suggesting that uh, the TF or the tritide coordination with the fluorine atom is, um, has a better coordination, which suggests a higher solubility. Uh, this sort of explains what we've observed experimentally, uh, whereas uh, molecular tritium gas has a lower coordination with those uh, fluorine atoms, suggesting a lower solubility. Uh, however, this is sort of the wild west right now. We don't have a full understanding of this. Um, or speciation and impurity contributions uh, also play a huge role in what the solubility will be in tritium, of tritium and salts. Uh, conversely, the diffusivity of tritium and fluoride, fluoride salts, um, this span in the sort of literature data spans one order of magnitude. Um, molecular tritium is suggested to diffuse faster than tritium fluoride. This is also backed by recently published DFT calculations. Um, but again, there's sort of many more iterations of uncertainty, uh, such as fission products, other impurities uh, in that salt system. 
But now I'll go over sort of some uh, hydrogen and deuterium permeation results that we measured in our lab as part of the MSR program. What we looked at was uh, Hasteloid N, which was the structural material, the MSRE, uh, because of its excellent compatibility with FLIB. Uh, what we did is we took a sort of 20 millimeter uh, OD disc that was 1.4 millimeters thick of uh, polycrystalline Hasteloid N supplied by Haynes International. And then we tested for deuterium and hydrogen permeation through that structure. Uh, from that, we're able to calculate the, the permeability, diffusivity, and solubility from 5 to 700 degrees C, uh, with applied pressures from 13 to roughly an 13 pascals, roughly an atmosphere. And um, we were able to confidently report the, the permeability of both deuterium and hydrogen in um, Hasteloid N, as well as the diffusivity and solubility. As far as hydrogen transport in, in 316 stainless steel, this has a much larger uh, database for literature values of both 316 and 316L. Uh, we have our sort of preferred properties uh, shown here. Uh, this was carefully measured, reports the permeability, diffusivity, solubility, as well as the surface recombination and dissociation constants on, on 316, as well as oxidized 316. Um, however, there's still sort of a large active area of reaches for this, uh, trapping and defects, uh, the surface effects, uh, as you can see on that plot in the, in the upper right, uh, surface constants is recombination and dissociation of molecular tritium on 316, spans many orders of magnitude. Uh, there's also differences in 316 and 316L. However, there hasn't been any measurements in, in 316H. There's some sort of fundamental needs on understanding the, the hydrogen and tritium transport properties and materials and separate effects tests, particularly the diffusivity and solubility in the molten salt fly, uh, as well as the sort of hydrogen transport in structural materials, uh, whether that be metals, graphite, et cetera. We took uh, MSRE as a test case, looked at the uncertainty um, in transport properties, and were able to sort of bin what would be your rate limiting process um, observed here. And as you can see, uh, with that sort of line in the middle, depending on the uncertainty in your transport properties, you can be transport limited um, by all sort of three different processes, whether that's diffusion through your metal, surface recombination dissociation on your metal surfaces or mass transport in the salt. So what we really need to do is design an experiment uh, to, to elucidate this transport phenomena, as well as provide uh, verification and validation data for systems codes, such as SAM, as we heard earlier, which is the uh, systems analysis module uh, for advanced non-LWR safety analysis built to the Moon fra Moose framework. Alternatively, at INL, we have our, our MELCOR TMAP code that was developed for fusion system analysis. It's a modified version of, of MELCOR produced from Sandia, integrated with the, the Tritium Migration Analysis Program. So now I'll get over into the experimental design and what we're trying to do at INL to address some of these gaps in transport knowledge in molten salt systems. So what we're calling the Molten Salt Tritium Transport Experiment, or MISTI, it's a versatile test stand for tritium experiments in a forced convection fluoride salt loop. Uh, some of the major uh, equipment, we're working with Copenhagen Comics on their portable pumped salt loop. So they'll supply the salt tank, pump, flow meter, all encased in an inert atmosphere enclosure with ports routed externally that then we can hook up to, to our loop uh, where we can test the tritium transport phenomena. That includes a hydrogen injection system. Um, hydrogen sensors, a, a versatile test section that I'll talk about later, uh, sort of the first iteration shown there would be to measure the uh, diffusion of, of hydrogen uh, through a structural material. Uh, then we have a plenum that can also be leveraged for a few different reasons, uh, a few different scenarios, uh, particularly evolution into an off gas or cover gas, uh, as well as sort of incorporating other diagnostics. We're taking a phased approach on this experiment, starting with deuterium and fly knack, then adding, uh, doing a salt exchange, testing with deuterium and fly, 
And then finally, in phase three, we'll add tritium to the system and test with tritium and blood. Uh, some more sort of design overview. Uh, there'll be safety enclosures around this whole experiment. The Copenhagen Atomics Loop is an inert argon atmosphere. Uh, the external test section will be in a ventilated enclosure. That's sort of the best uh, engineering control for once we move to a tritium campaign. Um, the loop is designed with a, a five degree slope. So it allows passive draining back to the salt tank uh, for shutdown. Uh, the test section is vertical, uh, oriented vertically with the salt in, in this form flowing in a clockwise direction. So salt will be flowing upwards against gravity. This inhibits two-phase flow. Um, so we can hopefully have higher confidence in our reported sort of mass transfer values. Uh, we're trying to have, engineer this with minimized connections. So we only have the connections of the, the test section as well as then porting uh, to the loop. And then of course, there's all the other engineering things that we have to account for to just support it to allow thermal expansion. And then we'll have multiple trace heat zones. So now going into the various different components, uh, hydrogen injection system. So hydrogen solubilization into the salt can be achieved with neutrons by adding lithium tritide bubbling or permeation. Those are sort of ranked probably from the most expensive to the least expensive. Um, permeation, we believe is the simplest method that, that pr promotes this solubilization. Uh, it also allows us to, to measure how much is going into the system in, in a controlled manner. Uh, our design is sort of looks like a shell and tube mass exchanger. So we'll have five stainless steel tubes that are 10 inches long closed end and the sort of salt direction that are inserted into the shell in an inline square pitch layout. Uh, they're designed to be replaceable for the thin walls. We can also use that to potentially test other materials. Um, however, there's some uncertainty in that, as you can imagine, as we're flowing salt through there, uh, it might warp the tubes. Uh, the shell is just made out of a standard uh, nominal pipe size, so two inch pipe. Uh, made out of 316 stainless steel. Uh, our current design is unbaffled to minimize, minimize pressure drop, meets sort of heat exchanger design specs that could be changed in, in future iterations. A uh, key point here is we needed to ensure that by pressurizing those tubes with hydrogen, uh, we will achieve prototypic concentrations in the salt. Uh, we use some sort of simplified analytical models uh, that demonstrated that, as you can see in this figure. Uh, we can achieve those quote unquote prototypic concentrations uh, by supplying a pressure below atmosphere uh, into the loop. So that checks a box on that design spec. Uh, so hydrogen permeation detection in that test section. So we want to monitor the permeation rate uh, coming out of the test section. What we'll use is calibrated quadrupole mass specs. Uh, once we can move to tritium campaigns, we can add ion chambers or the tritium bubbler system. Um, for the deuterium campaigns, we'll calibrate those mass specs, calibrated leak standards. So another sort of issue is to ensure that uh, what we will measure out of the test section will be in the detectable range. The reported there is our estimated detectable range for the system. And in our test section design, uh, we did some simplified analytical models to show that we would achieve uh, measurable rates out of our test section. Our test section right now, uh, we'll look at 316H uh, with a 1.5 inch uh, outer diameter and 18 inch length. Um, the salt flows on the inside of the tube. Vacuum is pumped on the outside of the uh, tube in the shell section, hydrogen permeates uh, through the wall into the shell, and then we can measure it with the quadrupole mass specs. Again, our, our sort of analytical models suggest that the permeation rates will, one, be measurable in prototypical condition uh, concentrations. Uh, we've messed with a couple of different designs on this test section. Uh, one of the big issues was quartz to metal transitions you can't buy anymore in the larger sizes. So we've had to go to this, in, in my opinion, simplified design for our, our test section. Plenum, which is located on the top of the loop, is, has multifunctional purposes. It's uh, for the loop uh, evacuation. We can pump out the loop through ports in the plenum. 
uh, which allow bake out of the loop. Uh, it also supplies ports for an argon purge, uh, for loop filling, draining, as well as a cover gas during operation. Uh, it allows, obviously, the volumetric expansion and uh, allows us to insert diagnostics, such as uh, sampling that argon cover gas, gas chromatograph, and incorporating other uh, diagnostics, such as LIBS, Raman, electrochemic specs. Uh, and it's a custom TF flange lid, which has a sort of 150 degree C limit. Our gas distribution system is shown here. It's for phase one and two. Uh, the tritium operation will require a slight redesign. Uh, the deuterium permeation through that uh, hydrogen injection system will be measured with a isometric pressure decline and a calibrated volume. So essentially fix a volume, record the pressure decline over time. Uh, the plenum and, and the uh, pump tank are both purged and can be analyzed with a, a custom gas chromatograph system. And then we'll have vacuum pumping and diagnostics for all our, our subsystems. We can test, uh, we're trying to design the test section so we can test other sort of candidates for control and mitigation, such as barging systems, absorption columns, or a more complex shell and tube heat exchanger. Uh, I've already sort of talked about our, our planned campaign. We're we'll start with deuterium and fly NAC, move to deuterium and fly, and with, with tritium and fly. So just as a summary, there's still a, a, a need for an improved understanding of sort of fundamental tritium transport properties in molten salt reactors, uh, such as mass transport in the salt phase, surface reaction on materials, uptake and diffusion of materials, and then evolution into the, the off-gas on them systems. Uh, this can be coupled between sort of confrontational chemistry efforts as well as separate effect tests. Uh, and then we're designing the, the molten salt tritium transport experiment, MISTI, to provide a versatile test stand to address some of these R&D issues. So thank you. It's time for food and beer. <laughs>